Welcome at Security on Air. My name is Frank Ter Kuile and I'll be your host today. Today we will be talking about the obsolescence of systems and my co-host is Bob Dijkman. Bob, welcome in the studio. Thank you, pleasure to be here. Um, technology is uh, rapidly uh, changing all the time and multinationals or organizations are implementing uh, new technologies all the time. Um, so that immediately means that some systems will become obsolete. And this is what we are uh, discussing today, how to identify, how to manage this, um, and how to uh, yeah, deal with this problem, especially when it comes to security systems, where um, this might potentially lead to a uh, risk. Um, we will explore this with three guests. Um, they are in the UK, so we will zoom them in. And our guests are Andy James from Jaguar Land Rover, Narinder Dio uh, from Cornerstone GRG, and Harry Blethin uh, from Flitch Technical Services. Welcome all in the studio, and I hope you can hear us well. Andy, we will start with you. You're from Jaguar Land Rover. I think uh, uh, the company itself, uh, everybody knows it, hardly needs an introduction. Uh, but could you uh, uh, please uh, briefly introduce yourself? What's your role and what do you do within Jaguar Land Rover? Yeah, sure. Hi, Frank, and hi, Bob. Uh, firstly, thank you for inviting me here to talk with you on this, uh, what I would see as a, a really important topic. Um, you also called me an expert. Well, uh, that's a, a real compliment. Thank you. I like to consider myself a student of security or a student of leadership. Uh, my name is Andrew James. I have the absolute pleasure of working for Jaguar Land Rover. I've been here for circa 18 years now in a variety of roles, but all within what we call corporate security and business protection function. Um, so, yeah, I work in the protection industry. I, I consider myself to be a part of the management team within corporate security uh, and business protection in JLR. And that means how many persons uh, are in your team? Um, so we've got probably about 450 people uh, across the globe um, with perhaps nine percent of that concentrated in the UK. Um, and for any UK uh, viewers, that's uh, mainly centered in the Midlands and in Liverpool. And how many sites do you, uh, uh, are, are you responsible of? Uh, pretty complex. Um, we used to be uh, a, what we would call a leafy Warwickshire company, actually. Uh, we have grown tremendously over, over the past decade, um, including our main sites and our, what we would call satellite sites. I'd probably estimate between uh, 25 and 30 um, uh, sites across the globe. And then, then the, um, 30 sites, I can imagine that is also uh, a lot of different uh, security access control system, video systems. Could you describe the landscape that you are facing? Sure. Um, and I think part of that landscape starts with our history. Um, so Jaguar and Land Rover, obviously two separate companies. Um, they had in or they, they did have very individual strategies uh, and people deploying, whether it's a process or a set of processes or systems, um, which leaves a, a complicated or a complex environment um, that you're trying to manage. Uh, you're trying to, in some cases, eradicate and move towards a transformative state. Um, so we've probably got in the access control uh, space, we've probably got five or six different systems across the estate. Uh, and that comes with, of course, three or four, um, maybe more card technologies that we are really working hard, but slowly um, in a structured way. Um, we're trying to move into a more transformed state. Um, so you picture that complex environment with 30 plus locations across the globe and you really start to realize just uh, the complexity of the change that's required here in JLR. 
Yeah, sounds impressive, uh, Andy. And, and uh, as you say, there are many challenges and then you have a, a lot of legacy also there and a lot of history. But, but what, what is it, your end goal? What are you trying to achieve? What is your North Star, so to say? <laughs> North Star, I um, love that phrase. Really interesting phrase. And it, it really does force you to take a holistic view or a helicopter view. Um, so we have this project, or I like to call it a movement. Um, it's called Connected and Secure. Um, at the heart, it is, of course, trying to eradicate or control or manage obsolescence. Um, but if I was to take that up a notch, then I would suggest that we are, I guess, chasing a game-changing, all-knowing, all-doing system that really benefits the whole of JLR uh, and not just security. Okay, so, so uh, your North Star is to be... Uh, not only security, but also be part of the business and all the other processes within JLR, so to support the business with JLR. Absolutely. Yeah. We're looking for a system um, because, let's face it, security in any organization is a cost. Um, so we need to provide value and be creative in that value. And our general belief is if we get an effective solution, it won't necessarily just serve security. Of course, that'll be a primary state for any system in the security uh, in the security space. But it should benefit the whole of JLR. Yeah, yeah, okay. And and you mentioned during the introduction uh, that, that at this point you still have a lot of different systems. How, how does that impact uh, your daily to day business or JLR at this moment? Yeah, it's uh, really tough. Um, we are partway through delivering our strategy. Um, I think we have some of the biggest challenges is controlling cost, uh, of course. Um, so whilst access control provides a security layer at the physical level, um, what we tried to do uh, was really explore the benefits of um, people data. Um, and at the moment, we're trying to manage five or six databases um, uh, underneath that. So that is a significant challenge. Our systems don't talk to each other, not, in the, not, not for the main part. Um, so if you were to take security um, at a triangle, so uh, as a triangle, so you will have a combination of people, processes, and technology. Um, some of our systems take a lot of manual intervention uh, to be able to maintain and manage in a really robust way. And by robust, I mean, of course, from a security perspective uh, and bridging any vulnerabilities that may, may be there in aged technology. Um, but also from a customer experience point of view, um, we've got people carrying two or three cards um, because we are part uh, or we are on our journey as we speak. So we're, we're at a inflection point right now where we have got a, a really healthy combination of old versus new technology. And it, now we're seeing the point where our newer technology will take over the old. Yeah, yeah I can imagine uh, three cards that's for the user uh, not very uh, convenient. Um, where do you begin? I guess uh, you want to, to eradicate that or you want to go to, to, to one card or, or to one system. How do you start such a project? Yeah, so we started ourselves, and I think large corporates will do this. You've got the cost control element. Um, so as a, a security manager within our um, area, the best thing I can do is really sweat the assets as much as we can. Um, so I need to make access control systems and other systems go beyond their life cycle, uh, if you like. But they go beyond the life cycle. Try and go as far beyond as possible um, without creating unnecessary or, or too much or too many vulnerabilities. Um, of course, because new systems come at a cost. Um, so our job really is to manage some of that cost. So we started with a business case, and I can talk about um, what we did in JLR if you would like us to. Yes, please do. Yes. So we started with a business case. Um, we built a business case based on, upon a hypothesis, mm -hmm. um, and that was really related to missing opportunities around data. So we didn't focus on the hardware, um, not even the solution at that point. We focused on data. And our strategy involved speaking to all functions because our North Star was getting that all-encompassing all system that would benefit the whole of JLR. So we spoke to every function. And what we were trying to do was unpick or understand their problems um, and then link those problems to the possibilities. 
So change in the system may not be able to solve their particular problem immediately, but what we are trying to do is provide the infrastructure to do that in the future. And I've got an example to bring that to life. So when we spoke with our finance director and we were sharing our vision, he said, uh, Andy, I've, I have a problem around fleet control and we need to reduce our fleet. But the problem is no one can tell me utilization easily. So what we did was we linked our use of fleet to our fleet management system and then our access control at the gates so that we could use the data to drive utilization statistics. So every time a fleet vehicle came in and out of one of our gates, we would know. So now we have implemented, now that we haven't necessarily implemented that across the piece, but we have proved it's possible. Um, so we were able to offer a vision of how one data set could be so powerful. That was just a finance director. And what we found as we were going around the various different functions was every function had their own version of a problem that we could potentially solve uh, using our marketed solution. Yeah, so and before we knew it. I can imagine, you mentioned every different function. How many different functions or departments are involved in such a process? So across the whole of JLI, it was about 11 or 12. Um, and, and some rather large functions with some rather large problems too that we could uh, potentially address. That's, that's quite massive and, and also a nice uh, example you give of how you built those business cases. But how do you weigh all those opinions and, and needs of all those functions? Because so many people, so many needs and opinions. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> what, what we did in the business case is turn all of the problems and the potential solutions into pounds, shillings and pence. So we were able then to see fleet control was a big problem, um, but it may not as be a, as big a problem as loan working, for instance. So loan working was a health and safety problem. We have people coming in all times of day and night, um, but we had no real understanding of how people were in the facilities. They're large facilities, um, and we wanted to, to just make sure their safety um, was, was okay and they were, they were doing well where they were working. So we built loan working into the system also. And when you start using access control systems to try and manage some of that and use the data uh, accordingly or organizational utilization of office space, it, it starts to become really, really powerful. And these... These business case um, equations soon really, really add up. And therefore, it's an easier... Because what you're trying to do is sell a story. You're trying to sell a, a, an opportunity to JLR to say, here's what the return on investment looks like. Yeah. And that's how we actually got funded, by presenting um, a set of return on investment equations. Great, great example. Yeah, cool. Hey, and, and, and Andy, then uh, then the, the, the process starts. You, you make choices or you get funding. Uh, uh, then uh, the process of migrating to a new system or, a, or two new systems, or how does that work? Uh, where, uh, what does that look like at Jaguar Land Rover? <laughs> I'd start by saying painful. Um, <laughs> It, it, it's a complicated space, of, of course, and I, I guess the process is a hierarchy. Um, it ranges from easy through to the complex, of course. We had the quick wins, um, all the essential items, including building an ecosystem. So what we wanted to do, and, and let's face it, um, I don't know how, how well your viewers know JLR, but because we've been growing, we've been um, either purchasing new facilities or, or leasing spaces and moving people into, into those spaces. Um, so for a, a long time, it's felt like we're more of a property company than, than um, building our beautiful cars. Um, and that's what we've been trying to deal with. So the quick wins are if we're building a new uh, facility, you can obviously put the, the brand new system in and the chosen solution in. Where it starts to get really difficult is where you've got your remaining legacy sites. Yeah. So what we've done is built an ecosystem. That's our central server strategy. We've moved into multiple facilities uh, prior to us having that central strategy as well. So what that meant was we needed to build an additional server complexity whilst we caught up. All of that now has been eradicated, I'm pleased to say. Um, we've done that now. We've migrated across the central environment, which provides all new and future products with a consistent framework, really important. All new sites are therefore fairly straightforward now. We install 
AOS, actually. We install AOS and we go. Our people are trained. They're competent to manage that as a system. And we have a global management standard, something we call our Bible that we add to uh, every single day. Your Bible, even. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Our Bible, yeah. And, and uh, so for new sites, you've selected uh, AOS as, as the new access control system. But, but of course, how do you look towards the future? Because uh, in the end, all systems can go uh, obsolete. Aren't you afraid that what you've selected now uh, is, is, can come obsolete? And how do you deal with that potential uh, future uh, threat? Yeah, it's an interesting point, really. I think... Um, Being afraid of obsolescence um, is an interesting phrase as well. Um, this is why I choose to discuss managing obsolescence as opposed to eradicating it and seeing it as a, a legacy whilst leveraging it for as long as possible, sweating the assets. Yeah. Um, I would add that you need to trust the competence of your chosen partner. Um, first and foremost, if you... You, you'll go out to tender, and this is what we did. We went out to tender, of course we did. We looked at various different uh, providers and we, we looked at various different solutions. Um, but our chosen partner actually became a partner many years before Connected and Secure because that's when partnership starts. So partnership starts over a cup of coffee, having a conversation and adding value to each other. Um, so I think when you add the trust of the, uh, of the competence of your chosen partner, then you wouldn't expect to invest large sums of money only to be obsolete next year. You, you would expect that the partner protects their interests and yours uh, by future proofing um, as far as practicable and making things backward compatible in the future as much as possible. Um, so when people say to me, are you afraid of obsolescence? What happens in three, four, five years time? We need to change it again. I don't think we should be afraid of obsolescence. I think we should see it as a trusted friend because that's the... The, the thing, the stuff, the solutions we've put in in the past, and that probably the best indicator of telling us what the gaps are today in modern world and what we can do to help to improve the future. Yeah, nice. Managing obsolescence. That's uh, I like that one. Very nice. So are you also, uh, also implying that maybe technology is, is less of a factor than the partnership that you have uh, with the companies that, that are involved in the ecosystem? I'm definitely implying that. Um, I, I, I spoke uh, maybe just before COVID actually at a NSI event um, in Birmingham. Uh, and that was really centered on or, or really for the audience of integrators and manufacturers. Um, and I, I talked about partnership. And uh, I, I personally won't entertain going into big business, um, with, with, which, which involves cost and risk to our company uh, until we can truly trust our partnership. It is fundamentally the most important thing, I, I think, from a, a corporate perspective. And then um, um, five years down the line, uh, will you have reached your, your North Star, so to say, or is that uh, impossible? Or where do you want to be in five years' time from now, security-wise? Yeah, interesting. I think the North Star you should never reach because uh, if we are proactive and energetic enough, we'll constantly be shifting our expectations. And I think certainly in automotive, the macro environment is such a difficult place to predict. Uh, it's almost uh, impossible to manage. So I think sec uh, security as an industry, we need to keep working on our agility to respond to all factors and headwinds. Our job is obviously to be prepared. Uh, so what we'll do is continue to build that agility and resilience through our people, processes, and technology. And you know, if all goes to plan, then the great technology we're implementing will lessen the time needed to augment using people and processes or manual um, intervention. So I guess, uh, where will we be in five years' time? It may be a bit of a cop-out, but I hope to be doing the same thing we're doing now, only better, swifter, and perhaps with a richer customer experience. Excellent, nice. excellent. Nice. Well, um, I think that concludes our uh, brief interview, Andy. Thank you very much uh, for uh, well, uh, zooming or streaming in to the studio <laughs> today. Uh, I think it's been very interesting uh, uh, to learn how uh, yeah, an organization like Jaguar Land Rover um, uh, deals, with, uh, yeah, deals with these systems and deals with this topic. So thank you very much and hope to see you uh, at a different time. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Okay, now we will switch to our uh, next guests, uh, Narinda Dio from uh, Cornerstone GRG and uh, Harry Blethin from Flitch Technical Services. Um, Narinda, would you be able to uh, briefly introduce yourself and your company? Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm Narinda Dio, as you mentioned, Director of Cornerstone GRG. We're a leading independent uh, security consultancy that we've been providing our award-winning consultancy services internationally for the last 15 years. And I think it's important to understand that we do not install equipment, supply software, or provide guarding services. We assist our clients in providing holistic security consultancy services. So 100% of our revenue is from physical and cyber security consultancy services. Nice, and Harry, who is Flitch? Who or who is behind Flitch? <laughs> Hi, Frank. Hi, Bob. Yep. Yeah, so I'm Harry Blethin. I'm the technical director of Flitch Technical Services. We're you know, based out of the UK um, and a small firm basically dealing in, in kind of all things data, really, in, in the access control space. I, I started my career um, straight out of university and been in the industry for about 14 years, 15 years. Most of that spent on the manufacturer side. Um, and I kind of gravitated to you know the support side, but also all things data related and integration. So we've kind of, myself and a colleague have started Flitch to kind of offer those data integrations across a broader spectrum of access control products. Cool. Okay, so we have been uh, discussing with Andy about uh, Jagu uh, Jaguar Land Rover and uh, the obsolete systems. Um, Narwinner, what's your, uh, your yeah, point of view? Obsolete systems is, a, is an interesting term because the, the reason for obsolescence can be multifold. Most people think that uh, end of life or unavailability of equipment and so on is the obsolescence, and that quite often is true. But also some obsolescence can come from a, an operational perspective, i.e. that the systems they currently have don't have the, the functions or the requirements that they need, plus many mergers and acquisitions have led to organisations having multiple systems and multiple car technologies. So the reasons for obsolescence uh, need to be understood because the systems themselves could be still very functional, but not suitable for the client. And Harry, what's, uh, what's your take on this? Uh, I agree entirely with Narinda on this one. I mean, I tend to bucket obsolescence into those sort of two, two groups. One where you could argue that a, a user has hit a functionality ceiling um, and, and uh, despite the product being in its main life cycle, um, may not be fulfilling all the functions that, uh, that a client actually needs it to. And the other one obviously being a product falling outside of its development life cycle, or even possibly still the product being within, uh, you know, being manufactured, being supported still, but the third party technologies on which it's dependent, perhaps not think of, you know, products reliant on old Windows XP workstations, for example. Um, and I think if I had one observation, um, I would say it's amazing how often the functionality ceiling is the driver for people uh, acquiring a new, um, you know, a new product, and less so the inherent security risks of something becoming obsolete. So it'd be good to kind of flip that round, really. I, I, I agree, Harry. And uh, some of that, one of those uh, requirements, quite often is extended reporting capabilities, which some systems don't have that, and clients now need for uh, for uh, regulatory purposes and also to provide to their own clients uh, reports in a particular format, which many systems don't. Uh, they've been in for many years, don't produce. Yeah. Sure. And then, Narendra, are there other indicators that, that, that uh, systems uh, uh, run obs uh, obsolete? Yeah, I, I think the other, other area is probably to do with the, the front-end reader technology because uh, it's related to security, but it's also related to usability, would be, uh, Bob, the, that uh, the card reader technology currently deployed by the client may be uh, at risk. So, for example, there are card technologies, proximity technologies that have been installed for the last 20, 25 years that are now um, insecure in that they can be very easily copied. You can walk into a shop with a card and actually get a, a direct copy of it. Uh, standard MyFair, you can go onto the internet and uh, for, for $50, uh, you can buy equipment that can actually copy that card. So that's probably one of the other reasons that people look at uh, upgrading systems. Yeah, yeah, I see. Thank you. And um, and um, uh, yeah, these are of course big risks. Uh, what other impacts do uh, do organisations face? Uh, do you have examples from the field here? Yeah, so I mean, one of the big risks is is compliance, obviously, and um, the obviously with 
outdated technology comes, you know, those those third party dependencies that we mentioned. Um, I mean, I, I all too often, unfortunately, have seen the ramifications of, uh, you know, clients dealing with uh, obsolete products that are no longer manufactured. Um, you know, huge multinationals that um, have had critical system failures as a result of, of products. And, you know, days later, once the normal services resume sometimes, um, you know, the client's still living with that risk on, you know, on their shoulders that that product may do exactly the same thing and, and there's going to be no crucial security updates to it. So the, the compliance one is a huge side of things. I know that you are probably not uh, allowed to, na to name any names, but, but, but do you have a, a real example that you uh, came across? Uh, uh, absolutely, yes, yeah. I mean, too many to mention, to be honest, but in all verticals that you can imagine. So, um, you know, broadcasting, it, uh, you know, customer had a huge outage there that, you know, the, the you know, business um, cost when you, you're dealing with tens of thousands of cardholders that can't access doors or can't even egress either um, uh, is, is, you know, incalculable. It really is. Yeah. And then you, Narinder, did you encounter these examples yeah, I mean, in your work field as well? Yeah, very, very similar, similar examples to Harry, but I think the, 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 the biggest risk that these people have, is, as Harry said, is impact and their inability to do their business. I've once been involved with a, an investment bank where uh, for a number of reasons, the, uh, the people were locked out, including the investment bankers. So the potential damages of the bankers not getting back to their uh, trading desks and being able to trade is into the millions. Yeah. So, but the, the, the thing is people, quite often organizations are unaware that their systems are coming end of life or are in this critical state until they reach it, which, uh, and part of what we all need to do is to actually let people know that they need to be uh, uh, managing their system so they don't get into these scenarios. Yeah, big impact if you don't do anything. So uh, yeah. what then if a customer comes to the point they've decided my uh, access control system or security system is obsolete and I need to get into action? Uh, Harry, where, where do they start? So, I mean, I think any replacement of an access control system it, if it doesn't take months, it will take years, uh, is, is the truth of the scenario. So um, I would say the first thing to do is, is genuinely assess the risk of the incumbent product, um, because there may be things, um, you know, that you can do in the interim between now and, and acquiring a new product that will at least bolster the, the product you've got. So if it is running on old operating systems, can kind of be uplifted to, to newer um, new OSs that will mitigate some of that risk around it. But ultimately, once you've done as much as you can around protecting your, uh, you know, your incumbent product, then I would say um, identifying stakeholders and focus groups uh, or, or user groups within the business is, is key. So, you know, who's going to own the system? Who's going to support it? Who's the end user? Um, and who's going to deploy the platforms that it resides on? I think only once you know that can you really get a coherent set of requirements together and actually take that to market. Yeah, yeah, that's in line with what Andy also said. He, at the Jack and Land Rover, they also tried to stretch the limits of the legacy system so that sweating they, it, uh, yeah. s sweating, 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 yeah. the, sweating the asset is, a, is, a, is an interesting one. Yeah. Um, but in, interestingly, it's also a question of whether they actually know what assets they have, because the one of the as, as uh, mentioned by Harry, you know, getting the the planning and understanding, but but actually we have worked for many organisations right around the world where individually at local level they may know what their assets are but as an organization they have no understanding of how many card read, what technologies are used even what access control systems they may have so one of the first things is actually to understand what your estate exists of yeah yeah true true an inventory and just simply going there and make an inventory list of how many doors or does it, it go up to yeah. that level it, Frank, it goes to uh, down, down to even lower levels. Uh, we recently did a project across EMEA for a client where, I'll, I'll keep it generic, we had to survey over 50 sites uh, and actually make a, 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 an inventory, an asset of what they had, where they had it, what technologies they had, but also an understanding of cabling because going to the next level, they wanted to implement OSDP DP, um, protocol whether their cabling, existing cabling, which had probably been in 20 years as well, was suitable for it. So that process 
was absolutely necessary before we could start anything else. Yeah, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. And and, and there then, uh, Harry also mentioned uh, stakeholders. C c can you elaborate a little bit on, on what yeah. typical departments? Uh, so what 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 type of parties you get to deal with uh, when thinking of? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, interestingly, access control touches everybody. And I think one of the things to understand is in terms of, of, of an upgrading of any system, access control is probably the most complicated. Uh, if you were upgrading a CCTV system, it would impact very few people. Very few people will be aware that it has been upgraded. But with an access control system, you need to start the whole broad user base because one of the first things is that once you've found out what information you have, as Harry said, who does the system belong to? Is it security? Is it facilities? Then you need to interact with IT, uh, HR, in terms of uh, how you're going to onboard and offboard people. Da you know, the, the database that may exist may be out of date, and, and you may need to start again. You also need to work with the uh, the guarding company in terms of what processes and procedures they have in place. So it's it's a very very broad, much broader than people understand, and actually communicating with the users is really important, actually explaining to them what you're doing and what they need to do in the process. Yeah, it touches all employees and all departments in, in, the, absolutely. in the company. Do, do, do you have anything to add there, Harry? No, Narinda's absolutely spot on there. I mean, the only other thing I would say is, is access is broad in terms of who it touches, but but what it touches as well. And, and obviously from an integration point of view, um, more and more obviously we see data coming from third party sources. So you have to consider um, if I move this, is this over here still going to work? So, um, yeah, there's people, but there's things as well that, that it impacts. Yeah, it, it does not sound like a typical Windows update. or uh, It's, it's yeah. a bit more challenging than that. that yeah, no, absolutely. Way, way more challenging. And, and you know, equally, if you think about access control, the cards that need to be issued, if you have a population, we said earlier on, of 10,000 people, you need to issue those cards to those 10,000 people before you actually start the upgrade because otherwise they're going to get into a situation where they will not be able to enter areas as the upgrade occurs if they don't have those cards, uh, the data captured, which may be biometric, the pictures, and issue to them in good time. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Harry, and then um, at a certain point, a, uh, you go through all these preparations and it probably takes a lot of time and, and uh, a, a new system is selected. Um, and also, this uh, takes uh, a lot, of, has its challenges. Uh, what do you typically encounter from your point of view? When uh so, I mean, obviously, one of the huge challenges to replacing it is is financial. If you you know you go to a, any large, you know, medium to enterprise size system and say you've got to replace, let's say, 300, 500 door controllers, the the, the cost of doing that in a single financial year can sometimes be obstructive, to be honest, uh, you know, regardless of the security risks inherent in the product. So, um, you know, there, there's a real financial um, challenge to be overcome. The second, obviously, is, is logistical. Um, you know, as Narinda touched on, if you are replacing an access control system over three, six, 12 months, that is that amount of time for which people will be inconvenienced. Uh, uh, you know, if you, whether you're replacing just door controllers or going to the lengths of replacing readers or door furniture, people will be inconvenienced, and that's a challenge that people have to overcome. Sometimes there's uh, monetary costs involved with man guarding. Um, you know, from my perspective, for what we do as business, uh, we're always looking at the data side of things personally. So, you know, data is everything. It's the absolute key um, to managing a, a successful migration and, and being able to adequately identify, cleanse, and, and migrate data into a new product is, is absolutely the, the starting point of any, any good system mig migration or upgrade. Is that You're difficult to do? Um, it, it can be. I mean, so most products, to be honest, have a, a basic um, you know, migration tool. Uh, but, you know, they're usually pretty rigid, to be fair. And as a result, and I think sometimes a lack of perhaps understanding of the, the uh, real need to cleanse data, uh, what we find customers often either doing nothing or all of it. So they either go, okay, well, we'll input all of our data by hand. That's only really applicable to the very small systems. You go to the enterprise level, they can't do that. And so they lump everything across, you know, junk, superfluous data and all. And, and it's not the best way to start a new product life. <laughs> yeah, sorry, and, and Narinda, you also, you had something to add to that. Yeah, no, I was just going to add to the, the data element of it, uh, and, and, it, and it, it applies right across the board, is planning. The planning of this type of project is probably going to be as long as the implementation period because, as we've all all of us have agreed, that this touches so many different people. The plan you cannot plan in too much detail. 
because as you're migrating areas over, and uh, and, ha and Harry alluded to it in terms of, are you going to need additional guards that need to cover and, and, and secure areas that may be insecure for a number of days that the systems are swapped over? So the costs aren't just the costs of the uh, the equipment and so on. There are the uh, man guarding costs, but there's also the um, uh, consequential impact on business, loss of business type costs, or uh, having to put in other processes and procedures, which may take longer, for example, with visitors. And, and are companies enough aware of the fact that preparation and planning is important? Uh, I think generally speaking, no. They, they, it's only when they engage, engage with, you know, with, with people like us, with like, people like Cornerstone, they actually start understanding that because we ask these questions. Have you considered this? What are you doing about that? Their perception sometimes is that uh, magically over a weekend almost, and I'm exaggerating slightly, that they'll be able to go from system A to system B, not understanding all the, the, the consequential uh, uh, tasks that need to be performed. Is there, uh, is there a typical time span for such a project? Is there, or... It's as long as a piece of string, Frank. It uh, literally is. As, you know, if it was a small number of doors, um, it could probably be done over a, over a month or so. And it, I wouldn't expect it to be any shorter than that. But we're doing projects and we're working on projects that literally are years. And I think uh, Andy may have mentioned in his uh, uh, earlier chat that they, theirs is over a multi, multiple years and, and most, most will be because they just do not have the, uh, you, you can, just cannot stop a business. These are live sites. So you have to do it in, uh, in conjunction with and without impact in the business too, too, you know, too adversely. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was going to say just to add, uh, you know, further complexity to that we've, you know, we've recently worked with a uh, a customer who is a multi-tenanted building. The landlord has swapped out their um, access control system, but the tenants didn't have their budgets and their financial years to do the same. And so they've actually found, um, you know, the, the landlord occupying one product um, and having to integrate that to an older product that the tenants still use, you know, primarily the tenants still use. So it's, you can get some really complicated scenarios that I'm yeah. sure, yeah, Narendra's dealt with most of them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Harry. And, I, and how do you foresee this in the, in the future? Will this uh, change? Will it become easier? Or what are your views on that, uh, Harry? I mean, so what we try and do from a migration point of view is to take a bit of an integrated approach. So, um, you know, we try and do all of the data cleansing to a bit of a specification, as I mentioned, and, and uplift that into a new product. But, you know, where we can, we like to try and, you know, especially for our enterprise customers, try and have some level of integration. You know, some of the challenges with running two systems in parallel for, um, you know, a really long period of time are, you know, having duplicate card entry and things like that. And, um, and so what we try and do is have some mechanism where at least the new system can cascade down card changes to the remnants of the old system while it's being swapped out. Um, I mean, in future, I think uh, what we'll start to see is uh, customers being more discerning on the longevity that they want from their systems. Um, and I think we've seen that in the shift from access control products being owned by what used to be facilities and estates, now more becoming sort of part of IT as a function. And with that, a more critical eye around risk. And I think um, a step towards that, we're not there yet, but a step towards that is going to be things like cloud hosted and, and SaaS models, where um, ultimately, you know, take a SaaS model, for example, a vendor can keep their clients' applications updated all the time. It yeah. takes away that compliance risk of version control and even move the IT compliance and footprint away from the end user to the vendor or manufacturer, um, you know, so solving loads of compliance uh, issues along the way. And I think. Um, just a single observation, I think that customers, there's a bit of a misnomer around security of data in the cloud, um, you know, storing personally identifiable data as access control does. Um, you know, what I would say is, it, you know, the, you take the big players in the sort of cloud hosted space, the Microsoft Azure's of this world and the AWS's, and you think of the investment that they can put into internet security for securing your data versus what a small to medium sized business could do for their own local networks. And, and I, I know where I would put my data, put it that way. So I think we will make the move, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. Yeah. <coughs> and and Narinda, do you have any tips for uh, large scale companies in, in a situation where they deal with obsolete systems or have multiple systems in place? It's, uh, I think, unfortunately, uh, know what you have and plan it very well. <laughs> uh, I, I think, you know, I couldn't emphasize those those two bits of information because the actual implementation itself is is probably the least complicated bit. 
once you start to you know taking off old equipment putting on new equipment that's a repetitive task but it's actually knowing where you're starting from and uh, you know we've uh, we've had scenarios where the clients told us they have all the information we have started project managing this on behalf of the client and then all of a sudden we find that there's some additional uh, interfacing for example you know during the discovery stage we would be asking which systems do you interface to and we've even had scenarios where they say these are the only systems we interface to as soon as you start changing something stops working they go oh this has stopped working and so nobody said you were interfacing to this other system so know what you have and what the connectivity in the real world and in the cyber world is yeah excellent guys Okay, I think it's uh, time to wrap up. I think it's been a very interesting topic that we have discussed from uh, different perspectives and clients, consultants and people that are actually in the field migrating data. Um, I would like to thank you all for your attention and hope to see you next time at the next Security on Air.